This is Coder Radio, episode 279 for October 16th, 2017. everyone, and welcome to Coder Radio, Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly talk show taking a pragmatic look at the art and business of software development and related technologies. This episode is brought to you by our two fine sponsors, DigitalOcean and Linux Academy. I'll tell you more about those great sponsors as this year's show goes on. My name is Chris, and joining us, I believe now stationed in some sort of bunker, it's our host, Mr. Michael Dominic. Hello, Mike. Good talk. Ed Fisher. So we have uh, we have much to cover this week, Mr. Dominic. Uh, yes. Of course, some topics that I think towards the end of the show are, are going to we're really I, I'm just really looking forward to talking about. It. Let's put it that way. I don't even want to give it away, but I got I just got to we got to clear the air on a couple of things now. So are are, it, are the rumors true? Are you currently stationed in some sort of development compound in the swamps of Florida? Could you clarify the rumors for me? It is a small compound in the swamps of Florida with a sales guy a developer, and one of the most incompetent high school students I have ever seen in my entire life. So, okay. Welcome to the team, buddy! <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is, is this the individual making you coffee right now? Well. Trying to? We could call it coffee, okay. I guess. I see. I see. This is part of the problem, isn't it? This is part of the problem. You know, yeah. today's youth just, I don't know. Yeah, no, I understand. I got a, I got a few of them myself. And sometimes yeah. I like to pretend like I am one. Well, uh, you know, much to talk about, and uh, it appears that there is much to do about Kotlin these days. Uh, you and I talked about it, um, I don't know, what was it? Jeez, it seems like just not too long ago, but it must have been closer to Google I.O. back in May. Yeah, it was, it was during I.O. Yeah, and uh, it, it seems like there has been some, uh, what, what they like to call traction since then. Yeah, so Kotlin is taking over. Um, it's expected to outstrip Java for Android development very shortly, and it is already more than 50%, or it's already just about 50%, rather. That seems That's... seems really... Okay, so here's the number. So according to a report by Realm, mobile development platform Realm, the announcement skyrocketed Kotlin's adoption amongst Android developers. The adoption rate for Android apps doubled from May uh, from 7.4% right. to 14.7% by the end of September. If the growth continues... Kotlin will reach 51% market share by December 2018. 51%. So that would mean Java would then become statistically a minority on the Android platform. Yeah. Seems like that is a lot of um, um, a lot of typical Silicon Valley uh, projections. Like, people are just going to buy iPads to infinitum, and the uh, Moore's Law is always going to be Moore's Law, and and then it turns out we sort of plateau off and growth sort of stops. Well, I mean, it's a weird projection, right? Because, you know, half of the gradle dependencies you're going to pull in are going to be Java anyway. So I, there's still a whole lot of Java running on these Android devices, even if this is true. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, good point. And, I, you know, we see this on the Apple side, right? A lot of old-time Objective-C developers, older, angrier, grumpier people like me, are still clinging to their square brackets uh, and using them where possible, but begrudgingly using Swift when they have to. I can't imagine the same thing doesn't exist for the more deep Android folks. Hmm. I think, too, you got to figure that there is a fair amount of people that are, are, and this is sort of the supposition of the article, too, that are abandoning ship just because they feel like the future of Java and, the, uh, or really, it's really what it is it's Oracle and Google's mm -hmm. relationship is deteriorating. Yeah, cool. There's some right the lawsuits with Oracle and Google. There's some political shenanigans with the uh, with the Java. Uh, I can't remember the name, but it's basically the steering committee right in Oracle and how that's all going down with the Open GDK. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and so uh, it's clear they say Java on Android is dying. The Realm team explains. In fact, twenty percent of apps built with Java before Google I/O are now being built with Kotlin. Kotlin may even change how Java is used on the server, too. In short, Android developers without Kotlin skills are at risk of being seen as dinosaurs very soon. That's, uh, that's not even mild. <laughs> that's, uh, 
<laughs> that's like kicking you in the gut is what that is right there. Like, uh, hey, Android developer, you, 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 guess what? You better get scared because the Kotlin monster is coming. I'm sorry. He's trying to push down the pump on the French press with two fingers now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's got to get him out of there. Get him out of there. Get him out of that this job. This is gold right He's, here. They can't make coffee like that. Ah, uh, jeez. You know what? Don't, don't don't you remember when like kids used to like know how to make coffee and shine shoes? I made it for my grandparents. I used, I used to, make to make coffee, coffee. Mm-hmm. by smuggling myself down to Colombia, harvesting the white cocoa flower. Oh, this coffee. Oh, I'm confused. Never mind. <laughs> uh, you know what's weird about today's episode, too, besides the fact that you have a, a young boy in your room making you coffee? Uh, are yes. you wearing a robe, by the way? And what, But the other thing that's <laughs> weird about this is Skype is not tracking the call time. We This call length right now is zero minutes and zero seconds long. So this is a call at a time. It's a weird episode. It's tracking it on my side because I'm because I'm on a better operating system. Than oh you. Jesus! So listen, uh, this isn't really relevant to the show today, but uh, I've gotten a lot of questions about this, and a lot of people wondered if I'm going to do a special. So I guess it's worth mentioning today that people are really shitting themselves over Crack, the uh, new attack against WPA2 that's been disclosed. Uh, the Crack is key rena- key rena- geez, key reinstallation attack. There you go. Um, and uh, it essentially lets them do all kinds of horrible things against WPA and break it. And it's mostly all client side that's affected. I think it's all client side issue. And so patches are rolling out for everybody right now, but, uh, seems like it's one of those things where like this thing that we thought was safe, like WPA two, um, the golden child of Wi-Fi encryption. Oh yeah. By the way, here's just this little key reinstallation attack that I can do that uh, allows me to manage the middle of your bit. What? Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah. It really is. Now, vendors have been notified because there's already a bunch of vendors that have uh, patches out. Android, it seems like over 40% of Android devices are affected, and uh, the patch is still in the works there. And, of course, the first devices that will actually get the fix will be Pixel devices, and then it'll be up to OEMs to distribute it from there. So that you know what that means. That means there will be maybe quite literally hundreds of thousands of Android devices that will just be left unpatched. I'm not taking your bait. I am not ranting about Android device no. patches. No, there's nope. no rant to be had. That's, that is just what yeah. it is now. That is just the. That's just what. That's where we're at. That there's no rant to be had there. That's just the reality of it. Um, and Microsoft yeah, and Apple and all them, you know, shenanigans are putting their stuff out. Doesn't really well, affect actually, us, but I don't know. It felt like since everybody's freaking out about it today, um, it was worth yeah. mentioning. Yeah. So I don't know. The chat room I, and myself are pretty skeptical about this. Um, about this article about uh, Kotlin. Now, Bleeping Computer, I'm, you know, I got nothing against them, so they're the publishers of it, but it's a study that was done by Realm. T- to, so, say, to say that if you don't know Kotlin, uh, you're going to be a dinosaur very soon, that just feels too much. So I would say if they had rephrased it to new projects will be started with Kotlin as the base, that would probably be a much stronger, much easier position for them to defend, right? Hmm. Yeah, okay. But the idea that you have like a multi $10,000 or rather $10,000 mine Android project and you're going to go ahead and toss that out <laughs> and just to get rid you know, to rewrite it in Kotlin. And then, you know, if you're a purist, you're going to rewrite all your dependencies out of Java, right? That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. No, okay. Yeah, that's where my skepticism comes in. Yeah. We have, uh, we probably have uh, much more to see though, because it does seem like a safe bet. And they have, they, you know, you feel, I'm looking now at their uh, report right now. I went to realm.io slash realm dash report if you actually just want to see the source report. And uh, they also, they also do some studies on Objective-C. Um, now they say that Swift is towering over Objective-C for iOS developers. <laughs> that makes me happy. Just to, just to tor- torment you a little bit. Uh, interesting, all kinds of stats. Western develop, developers are quicker to adopt new iOS tech than uh, India or Japan or Makes Russia. Sense. I suppose so. They're also yeah, quicker or, to drop the oldest versions right. of iOS. U.S. developers yeah. are the quickest to, ver- to, to drop iOS 8. Um, for iOS, Germany and the U.S. are always at the top uh, for, uh, I think, revenue? Oh, for adoption, for iOS 11 adoption. With Android, Asia leads the pack. Not too surprising there. Well, this is interesting, this whole report. Here's the part about Kotlin. But yeah, and they call it Kotlin Rising. 
2018 will be the year of Kotlin. It'll overtake Java and in December of 2018. That's about 17 months after Google announced official support at Google I.O. and 2.5 years after Kotlin reached version 1.0. Is by, it also the year of the Linux desktop? Well, by contrast, here's an interesting comparison note. It only took 14 months after Swift 1.0 release before it hit the same milestone. So it's actually on a slower trajectory than Swift was. So that actually puts it in perspective, doesn't it? It does seem like maybe then it would be possible. So for some reason, I was thinking this was this was having... I was just thinking this is just some like early adoption rise, but I guess if if you've seen the same trend in Swift even more aggressive, it would stand to reason there would be an equal trend over an Android that might just not be quite as aggressive. So perhaps Realm knows what the hell they're talking about. You can download the whole thing from their site too. Realm.io is where they have it. I'm sure it's a you know it's all part of a, a marketing push for them too. Well, Mr. Dominic. Now you really got me. Now you really got me thinking. I was. I started. I went into that as a skeptic, and now I'm not so sure. I'd like to hear what the audience. Now, you're a now I might be. I might be. I might be a Colin believer. Audience, let us know what you think. CoderRadio.reddit.com. In the meantime, if you're thinking about getting into Android development or Linux or anything really around Linux or any of the platforms, consider Linux Academy. LinuxAcademy.com/coders. That's where you go to support this show and sign up for a free seven-day trial. It's a platform to learn everything you need about Linux, get hands-on experience for every Linux, cloud, DevOps topic, AWS, Azure, OpenStack. They have course schedulers that work with you. And like I said, Android development too. Lots of stuff that is just... Um, Really, really useful. Even if you're not like going to get into Android development as a daily thing, you could go to Linux Academy as part of your subscription. In fact, if you're watching the video version right now, I'm logged into my Linux Academy account, and I'm looking at the Introduction to Android Development course. And uh, it's a course schedule. It's really easy to help. It just helps you complete a course at your own pace. You choose what and when you want to study, and they create a custom schedule to help you reach completion and meet your goals. You even get automated email reminders to help you stay on top of training. And what I love about this kind of stuff is they break it all down into an easy-to-understand time commitment. Six hours, 41 minutes, 27 seconds. Six hours, 41 minutes, and 27 seconds. Well, I've watched that much Rick and Morty this year. I could watch that. I mean, come on, give me a break. So this is what's really powerful about Linux Academy. Plus, they have downloads you can take with you. You can start, and get it, you can get the things offline. So you can start the course, download the uh, comprehensive study guide, get the audio for it. Pretty nice linuxacademy.com slash coders. You go there, support the show, and sign up for a free seven-day trial. And they got everything you'd want to know about Linux, too. And um, Ruby, Python. There's lots of, there's lots of all, like, they have this whole nugget category, so there's tons and tons of different topics in there. They're like singular topics that are useful to learn, that give you value. So I could list them all off, and I, I often, uh, I, I fail to mention some of the juicier ones. So just go check it out. That's why they got a seven-day free trial linuxacademy.com slash coders and a big thank you to Linux Academy for sponsoring this here, a Coder Radio, a program. So uh, Mr. Dominic is swimming in laptops these days down in the bunker and one of the new laptops that's come across his desk is System 76's Galago Pro. That's right, I call it my Silver Fox. <laughs> that's good actually. That's a, Now uh, this one uh, for, uh, for you is running on the uh, Pop! OS that they've been working on. And um, I imagine uh, you're using it for uh, many, many little developer uh, thingies and shenanigans over there. So tell me all about it. Give me your thoughts and how it's uh, worked as a work machine. So, yeah, no, it is. Um, OK, so we have some comments here on this. It is overall a very nice laptop. Now, I'm going to compare it to two machines, the, the, the Lemur, Lemur, whatever they call it. Lemur. The and the 15-inch MacBook Pro I'm currently talking to you on for reasons that I just got an iOS project. In terms of, let's just start right from the top, right? The general power of the machine is great. I have the uh, i7 model, 13-inch chassis, great size, great power. The fan does spin up like a TIE fighter trying to kill Luke Skywalker. Is that a problem for you? Does machine noise bother you? You know, it used to not bother me. But more and more it does. Now, it doesn't bother me to the point of, like, you know, that it's a deal breaker for the machine. 
but it does bother me to the point that I notice it. Yeah, and I'll, I'll even, uh, on a system with really bad machine noise, I'll find myself altering my usage behavior, so maybe I don't use Chrome, or maybe I don't run the Plasma desktop, or uh, maybe right. I don't use Compiz on Mate, because... Well, well you, it, know, you know what it, yeah, you know what it does bother me, though? Maybe a practical case. Um, in the evening, if, by the grace of God, my wife has somehow got our son to go to bed, and we're sitting on the couch trying to watch a movie or TV, and I'm trying to do a little bit of work because we have to keep the volume so low on the TV that the machine noise right there in my lap actually sounds pretty significant. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately yeah. for uh, my tired and slow and simple brain, uh, I find it to be quite distracting. And it's sort of like steel. It's like it's like a background process that steals like 10 to 15 percent of my brain CPU where I keep checking in. Oh, yeah, the fan. Um, because I, for my entire life have been oriented to like listening to my machine and I have fewer and fewer cues. You know, I used to have a modem and I used to be able to hear the floppy drive and I used to be able to hear the hard drive really cracking and searching and, 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 and grinding it out. And then you could hear the fans and over time computers have become these silent boxes, which I do actually appreciate. But then that means the remaining sound that I get out of these machines is a, is a, is like one of the few audible data points I get about how my computer is performing and in, and what I what I have found is that a lot of fan noise tends to be very distracting because it makes me think my machine's under a lot of load, even when the fan might be kicking in more aggressively than it needs to. And I found that to be more common with Linux systems that you have uh, 4K screens on. It just seems to be, uh, you know, you got an i7 in there and yeah. you're pushing a 4K display. I don't know if you are, but if you t- yeah, you are, yeah. If you're pushing, I am a, pushing yeah. 4K, but yeah, i7 mm-hmm. exactly. Yeah. Yep, that's that combo tends to just make it run hot. So the battery life probably isn't so great either then. So yeah, let's do all the negatives first. I think that's fair. Um, the battery life is just, like not workable for me in a lot of ways. I'm averaging about four and a half, five hours. Yeah, yep. But yep. more on that four and a half. Yeah. It's it's a particularly uh, small battery in there too just because of certain design limitations. I think, yeah, it's, yeah. I want to say it's it's like remarkably low. Actually, you'd be yeah. surprised. In fact, I think they're even considering trying to fix that in a future rev. Yeah, I've heard some other things. Um, having said all of that, oh, there is one other really negative thing. The sound sucks. The speakers? The onboard, they're just terrible. Mm. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're, I would say they are actually the worst thing about this machine. Mm. Because they don't... Do you remember MIDI files? Yeah. Everything sounds tinny on Oh yeah, yep, yeah. I've I've tested and that, that. Yeah, I heard that. Yeah, it makes me crazy. So now, granted, I don't I don't think MacBook speakers are particularly good either. And see, I disagree. I actually terrible. I think okay. the I think the MacBook Pro speakers are well, they're better. I mean, they're I think they're better. I think they're remarkable. And uh, no, but they're not like you know. I'm, no, talking, I'm, I'm thinking for the size of the machine. Sonos. Right, right, of course, of yeah, course, yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Just for in the in the in terms of the thinness of the machine for what you get audio quality wise. Uh, in fact, when I was in New York and editing in the hotel room and Noah was in the hotel room with me, he was blown away at the audio quality of the MacBook Pro 15 speakers. I don't know about the 13. Um, but, you know, even then, you know, you hook up a pair of headphones and the problem solved, really, for, you know, if you're working yeah. for long periods of time, that's kind of nice. So here's the things I like about the Galago Pro myself, though, before, before I let you go, is uh, you get a lot of power in a small machine. I mean, like you said, you can get an i7, you get a 4K display. Uh, it's 13 inch display, right? So 13.3 inch display. That's that's pretty competitive, just right there, just those specs on its own. So if you want something yeah. super portable, that's really nice. There's a few things that bum me about it too. Just while we're totally not off the negatives, I think it's a little disappointing that the you can't charge from the USB C. That is such yep. a killer feature for me with uh, other machines. And just the way things are going, yeah. Yeah, and then it would be nice that if the uh, if the LTE modem slot was empty, just to like was fill, not like dead. Yeah, fill right. it up. That, that, yeah, put a yeah. little, put a little like a you know a Although spatula you or a little splatter on there, or whatever. You can totally do that, right? You can pop in a uh, card reader there. I I think you could put an LTE. It's like for an LTE modem, so you could put like a right. You could. I, I've said card reader. I'm yeah. a transmitter. Yeah, I think yeah. you could. If you knew, if you could get it open and you could get to that spot, I think you probably could. Yeah, you can. I've seen videos on how to do that. That'd, see, that'd uh, be the, really nice. So here's my, I have one neutral thing. The screen is really gorgeous. Yeah. But I almost wish it was a, a Mac screen. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, I feel like that's one strength they gave up from the Lamar. Like the Lamar really had a really nice Mac screen. I know it wasn't as high res, and people are quick to say, well, this one's 4K, that one's not. 
but there's something about matte colors um, that I kind of miss. I think they're easier on the eyes in terms of like, I think because there's, there's less reflection, you know. Right. That's, that's I like the blacks on reflective displays, but I prefer mattes if I'm going to be in a work environment. Yeah. Yeah. So, so okay. So what about the positives? Uh, you know, in terms of working on this thing, actually. So it's writing. gorgeous. I mean, yeah. I've been I've been working on this thing. Um, I mean, right now. So initially, for about a month, I would say I was using it full time. And now I'm 50-50 between that and a new 15-inch MacBook Pro because I'm a driver. And this laptop would actually get comments from people. This is from 76. Like using it out, stopping at a Starbucks before a meeting or whatever. You know, we got to place your crazy coffee in Plant City that I sometimes go to. Because it's different. And it actually is really portable. And that's almost the biggest shame about the battery life is that it is a really stunning looking laptop, but you have to use it in small doses when you're out away from the power source. Hmm, uh, okay, okay. Another, another positive I found really, really good, I mean, I, I, I meant that to be positive, is the keyboard is, I think, better than the MacBook keyboards right now. And I think it's far better than the Lamar keyboards right now. Mm, yeah, okay, yeah. How much, RAM, power how much is, RAM did you put in yours? I went with 16 gigs. Okay. So that was my next thing. And, it, and it's upgradable, right? I think it's upgradable up to 32. Yeah, yeah. The, it is a powerful machine that basically I have not hit any kind of usage limitation whatsoever. Yeah, I feel like um, we are getting there with these. Like I just reviewed the Librem 15 and I had that same takeaway. It's like I can't really... I can I can encode video. I can build software. There are moments where I can really punish this thing, but for day to day use, I I could just see using this thing for years with the amount of power it has. I don't know. If yeah, I, will, I could but. see. <laughs> I could see. I could see myself using this for a long time. I mean, I have the habit of now, if I hire people who don't want to use their own beautiful little MacBooks, um, I'm passing them down laptops, right? So. So if money was no object, so say you know a client came to you and said, "All right, Mr. Dominic, you get up to uh, you get up to ten thousand dollars in a computer hardware budget. Why would you buy this over a MacBook Pro?" So the client gave me ten grand for hardware. Yeah, I would probably buy neither. Uh, if that was the case, right? Well, I was just asking specifically between those two because that's what you were comparing it to. I was going to also ask um, you like the XPS 13 or a Lenovo, but I'm just trying to well, see where I, this I fits mean, I, in. At that number, I wouldn't even buy a laptop, but... Well, I was just trying to take money out of the equation for you. Right. Uh, so say money was no object, essentially. You're moving money from the equation, uh, and you could pick any of the laptops available on the market today. Would you still go with the Galago Pro, or was it the sweet spot of performance and price, or a, what... It would it still so, would yeah. it still lead out? I guess is the question. Really? No. Um, and, uh, you know, and that's not not to be negative. I mean, value is a thing, right? I mean, System seventy six is a very value focused vendor, and in general, if you're comparing it to Apple, so is Dell, so is HP. Right? I mean, everybody who's not Apple, you get more bang for your buck. Um, but if like money was no object, you know, the three thousand dollar. MacBook Pro on my desk is probably the computer that makes the most sense if I had to pick one because I can do everything on it, right? I can do iOS. I, can, I mean, that alone, I can do iOS. I can do most of the web stuff. I can do Docker, but it's a little annoying. Um, no Ethernet, though. No built-in HDMI and mini display port. So, right. So this is the the thing I had in the review that I, that I did get some comments on on, um, on Twitter about. After all my bitching about USB-C, you know what? Resistance really is futile. Like, it is, once you have the crap you need to have to live a USB-C kind of setup, it's easier. Because it, you stop worrying about how many of this port, how many of that port. You know, the interface is standardized. Yeah. Um, yeah. Having power and monitor and one cable is just really great. Like, I'm, I'm, you know, because I, we, I have an office now in Plant City. I need a new monitor and new setup for my house. I'm actually waiting to buy a non-Apple monitor because I want it to run with the uh, with the more until I can find one that's at a reasonable price. That's actually just like USB C. You can just be powered by USB C. Sure. Because I, I I don't 
you know, I had conversations with folks from Systemic Six when I was there for the fan event. Um, and I got it. Like some of my criticisms were more like, well, you know, you're not the only type of customer, blah, blah, blah. I get it. But like this machine really is targeted at me, right? Like, you know, MacBook Pro user, we're the, we're the target here. So I, I actually would say give up the Ethernet jack. Give up some of the other stuff. Wow. And give me more. Yeah, I, I, w- I would go that far. And I would say even if you just gave it up to get better battery life. Just I stop would. fighting it. I mean, in one sense. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So as then somebody. Now, don't on the Bonobo and don't on the Lemur. Right. I'm mostly there with you, actually. Because I'll tell you, somebody yeah. who's been you know, making the transition, one thing that I, I do like about it now is I don't feel like I have uh, adapters for different laptops. Like each laptop used to have its own set of accessories. And right. So it almost was easier if I had multiple laptops, especially when I had multiple clients. I had multiple laptop bags and all of the accessories and all of the power dongle adapter thingies and whatever else I needed, serial to USB or whatever, whatever it was unique, was in that bag. It was all in that bag. And I would take the different bags. And now it's just all one set of accessories. I buy one, you know, this, I buy it for all my machines now and I like that. Yeah, it's, it's an imperfect analogy, but this reminds me of, remember PCI and then PCI Express came out? Yeah. I used to have two machines. One was PCI and one was PCI Express. And I used to always go buy, you know, aftermarket parts. And you always have to think, oh, okay, does this come in Express? How much more are they charging me for the Express interface? You know, which which rig do I put it into? Yeah. Um, and I think we'll get there, right? I, at this point, I don't, you know, the Google Pixel is now USB-C, right? At this point, I think the market is going to, kicking and screaming, drag, everybody else to USB-C. Did you see that Marco made a post about USB-C that's gotten some attention? I did not, no. Oh, boy. Yeah, he basically, he calls it the impossible dream of USB-C. I'll put a link to it in the show notes. He says, I love the idea of USB-C, one port and one cable that can replace all other ports. It sounds so straightforward and unified, but in practice, it's not even close. And then he goes through and he builds a pretty good case against USB-C. Because yeah. he points out... There are problems. Right. The crux like of it is, call, yeah, I mean, we're yeah. thinking about this real quick. The crux of it is, by the time we get USB-C with Thunderbolt, USB-C with power, and which way charges what, and which laptops have USB, like your your Galago there has, uh, I think, uh, like a, a USB-C with two Thunderbolt port lanes, just like the MacBook Pro 13, where my Dell laptops here and my MacBook have uh, USB-C with Thunderbolt with four PCI lanes. Right, and so, my 15-inch MacBook here has, yeah. Yeah, same thing. And it's, so it's, right. kind of, it's, yeah. No, it's inconsistent, and there's not like a proper labeling to determine, to tell you what right. cables can support what. And I get, what his core point is, by the time we get there and everything's sort of caught up, it's going to be time for a new connector that's maybe thinner or smaller or uses a different standard. Uh, there's already talk about USB-D. And uh, I mean, you know, so I don't know. I, I could just see. Yeah. I could well, just this, see. This is the problem of having such a weak standards body, right? Of having the, the USB standard not be rigorously enforced. But I do kind of feel like the consumers could help in a way. Like if the consumers don't know, right? They think USB is USB. People yeah. didn't get USB three from regular USB. I guess I mean us. If consumers like us oh. start buying machines and accessories that, and I don't know. I, I it seems like maybe then the industry would be motivated by sales. Yeah, to, now you're limited to like max, yeah. like high end max. Essentially, like where we have it, where we have it now, where we have right, it now. where you have it. Yeah. Right. So, um, all things considered, the the fan noise and the battery life not a deal breaker for you on the Galago. Not a deal breaker. Um, what I would say is this is definitely if you're in the market for a Linux laptop, take a look. However, I have a feeling next year's model, if they continue this line. We'll, we'll probably address most, if not all, of these problems. Why don't you just use your iPad Pro for all this stuff? If I were you, <laughs> that's I what I would be doing. I would just say, screw it. I'm done with a laptop for a bit. I'm just going to use my iPad. No, yeah, that's it's a huge-ass screen. It's a 12-inch screen on that thing. You know what? It just wouldn't work. Why? I, I can't I, run Bash. I can't run uh, Docker. Okay. And, well, right. yeah, okay, fair. I mean, that's true. You could remote desktop into like a... Instance, but yeah, yeah, you know, okay. that, if you're doing that kind of like, stuff, I meant like in like bed. Hack and touch, right? That's I was thinking like work. when you're at home in bed or you're at home just banging something out, like in a text editor. When you when you mentioned the noise problem uh, when you were watching TV, that's that was really the use case I had in mind. Is why wouldn't you just use your iPad Pro and just leave the Galago plugged in somewhere? 
Well, because the typing experience on an iPad Pro is terrible, ah, even with okay. the, uh, yeah. Yeah, the case. Sure. Yeah, right? okay, okay. Yep. Yeah, and the, and, and the Galago Pro does, like, System76 has been working a long time to get their keyboards right, and yeah. I think a lot of that I, work has come to fruition in the Galago Pro. Yeah, I think they've done a really good job with the keyboard. Yeah, I did. I, I, that was my impression, too, is it was a good keyboard, pretty good trackpad, lots of good I.O. overall, but it did feel like a Rev1 product to me to a degree, with the fans and with the USB-C not charging and the SIM port <coughs> and the battery life. It felt like It felt like they were essentially entering into a new category, laptops for developers, and this was their first take on it. And if you're okay with a first take, because at the end of the day, it's still powerful as hell, it's still got a gorgeous screen, so, and it's got a good keyboard, right? So some of the essentials, if, depending on what is important to you, it's there. For me, uh, I, for this generation, I would have, I, I, I'm sticking with my XPS 13. I already had one. So that's going to be my machine in this category for now. But I would definitely be willing to consider uh, the next iteration of this, which I think will be a lot more competitive with the XPS 13. Yeah, and I think competition will make this market better. Yeah, yeah, but. and uh, it's good to see System seventy six in it. So we have more to get to. That's not we're not actually we're done talking hardware for a bit. I think because uh, <clears throat> you got to talk about the future, and future. you found this article. Uh, why isn't Agile working? Which at first is like, oh, here we go again. And then I read it and I was like, holy shit, this guy is a genius. This John Cutler guy is a genius. Oracle of Delphi over here, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> ooh, I gotta, ooh. I got to tell you guys, uh, buckle up, buckle up. I guess maybe first, though, before we get into DigitalOcean, should we talk about uh, Hacktoberfest? Because this is obviously DigitalOcean related. Yeah, so if you want to do some open source and you want a free t-shirt from DO, go yeah. to their hacktoberfest.digitalocean.com and uh, you can contribute to any open source project. I think you need to show, I think it's like three commits or something, and they will literally mail you a t-shirt. Yeah. And if you're going to create a DigitalOcean account, why not apply our promo code, Coder Digital and get a $10 credit over at DigitalOcean.com. Boom! And they're a sponsor of ours, of course. And by doing that, you support the show. DigitalOcean.com. Use the promo code Coder Digital. It's one word after you create your account. They have SSDs for all the systems you'll deploy. You can get started in seconds, and they have data centers all over the world. They have a beautiful interface. <laughs> it's so beautiful. My whole body shook. It's beautiful. It's really good. I, uh, I say it with a passion of someone who struggled with the worst interfaces ever. If you've, if you've ever worked in banking... You have an idea of what I'm talking about. There's some of the old systems from the 80s that we had to work with that uh, it's, it's really remarkable to see the kind of horsepower you can throw around in seconds with DigitalOcean. And I love when they roll out new stuff. I love when they roll out new stuff because it's always well done. It's always extremely well documented, and it's integrated simply. And, and, the, API, and the API is, is always updated to take advantage of it. Right now I'm talking about object storage. This is DigitalOcean's new Cadillac service. They call it Spaces. It's beautiful, simple, reliable object storage. And you can get a two-month free trial over at DigitalOcean. So there's a, lot of, there's a lot going on. They got Hacktoberfest. Of course, they just got the great service. And then now Spaces. So go over to DigitalOcean.com, create your account, and then apply our promo code, Coder Digital. Then you just get a $10 credit, too. You can try out Spaces for two months. It's, it's remarkable. You can create a space in an in instant. It's scalable. It's available as a standalone service if you just want to, <clears throat> I don't know, throw a link around. You, you know, if you're looking for something to, to just publicly send a file to somebody and you want it to expire, it's great for that. Or if you want to integrate it in with your project and programmatically create storage when you need it, it it's, it's brilliant. DigitalOcean.com. The whole thing's good. Go check it out and then use our promo code Coder Digital. And a big thank you to DigitalOcean for sponsoring the Coder Radio program and have fun with Hacktoberfest. Looks like a good way to get some swag and help out open source. I think uh, that's a pretty big win win for everybody. Free swag. Okay, so <clears throat> why Agile isn't working? Uh, I got to read a few parts of this. I wasn't going to go into a ton of this, but this is, this is pretty good. Do it. Um, first of all, uh, he said, uh, I was visiting a relative a couple years ago and, uh, he said he, he was pissed. He said, I heard something like this. It was a sham. We changed the way we do everything. We brought in consultants. We hired these master project managers and nothing worked. It made no difference. There's no accountability. All I get is excuses. Uh, and I think a lot of us have heard a version of that before. Um, 
And uh, he's he says there's a couple core concepts I would I kind of need to communicate here. And he draws some pictures, so I definitely recommend checking out the link in the show notes to get the to get the picture or watch the video version. <laughs> uh, he says, first, if you look at lead time, the time from when you dream up an idea until it reaches customers, you'll notice that most of the time is spent waiting. You know, you're just waiting around for stuff. 15% flow efficiency is normal. And normal for 15%, that's work time and lead time. That's crazy if you think about it. Uh, but yeah, but what we focus on is just the relatively visible portion of the work, the small amount of time actually spent doing the job. The best companies in the world, he writes, hit 40%. The short story is to go faster, you need to address the waiting time. That, that really resonated with me, so then I kept reading. And, then, and I won't read this whole thing, <clears throat> but just a few more parts. Unplanned work and multitasking. This is something that I've been struggling with here at Jupiter Broadcasting. In fact, I've been struggling with even how to put words to it. I couldn't think about how to put words to it, to talk to you about it or talk about it on user air. Like I've been trying to conceptualize what the problem is and he just nailed it. This is so I'm experiencing this this very moment. <clears throat> he says it's not uncommon to have teams paying 75% interest on a combination of unplanned work and task switching. 75% interest on a combination of unplanned work and task switching. Oh, yes. This happens to me all the time. I come in to do something and we have a technical problem on one of our broadcast machines and that's what I end up fixing that day. It's literally, it's overhead. It's overhead to getting work done. The team may not even be paying down the principal. And often, it's never tracked in the ticketing system. Oh, man. Most likely the team complains about this, but it's ignored long enough and they just accept the dismal reality of it. Um, you have to address sources of unplanned work and quantify the economic impact of having a shared service. Like me, I am a shared service. Uh, shared services make intuitive sense, but they often inspire a good deal of expensive pre-planning. Um, that, that was really the... the uh, that was really the, the, the meat of what hit me. Uh, there's other things in here about benefits of realization. Um, but, and unmanaged complexity. But uh, that was the stuff like the, the, the fact that you, you, know, you, you, you don't account for the unplanned work and task switching that always comes up when you're a shared resource or dealing with a shared resource or service. And uh, that is always a big time suck. And then we only look at the time that is actually getting where we're actually doing the work which ends up being the minority of the overall project time spent i have so many thoughts on this i oh. don't even know where to start. well what do you do you, are you buying his premise because i was pretty i was pretty clicked in i i thought that worked i thought it worked yeah i'm pretty clicked in um i might phrase it differently mm. or maybe I, I i might not call it waiting because it really isn't waiting right i would call it Busy work and well, I would call it, so a comp, some combination of busy work, ceremony, and waiting. Yeah, waiting for decisions, ceremony, uh, process it could be a, you know waiting for process. You know this has to be sent to this department or this decider, or waiting for these artists to submit back their concepts, and you know that kind of stuff is just a lot of time spent doing nothing. You try to do other things in that time. Obviously, you don't just sit around. Right. I mean the. Um the one that really hit me actually was the unplanned work section. Yeah, me too. And, you know, un does unplanned, you know, unplanned can mean a lot of things, right? And what I'm finding is, I'm going to say a dirty word here, waterfall. Um, doing a little bit of architecture is not a bad thing. And that is actually extremely valuable for the customer, for you, and if it's your product, like with Atlas, for us, with your product, right? What I found is, you know, there was a lot of resistance for folks to want to like pay or invest in that sort of thing. Like even <laughs> if it's an internal team, <laughs> oh, well, can't we just like be, be agile, right? To start coding from day one. And you, you can, but unless you're like, you know, inheriting a rescue project, which I've done many times, I'm trying to do now, it's very, very, hard especially if it's written in swift never mind that last bit i you you end up wasting a lot of effort i mean really like yeah, yeah. like eight 
eight, you know, ten, really ten to like fifteen hours of just like pure architecture, yeah, can save weeks of work, yeah, and and maybe this is me getting old and crotchety, but someone tells you know, you're, are you are you really telling me that you are unwilling to pay an invoice for, you know, let's just even let's go high, let's say fifteen hours of like just one architectural session. But because you need to see commits, right? But you, you're happy to pay for weeks and weeks and weeks of churn and throwing things out and confusion and, you know, building in technical debt and system fragility, tightly, you know, all these issues that come out of just pure, like, bad architecture. Is that sane? Yeah, it is. It seems to be... Um it seems to be an unwinnable, an unwinnable fight, though, because uh, it, you know, I, I, I think it's, I think there's something about the protective nature of a business, and uh, when you have a big group of people working together, and there is a lot on the line for each individual, but yet nothing on the line for everybody in a whole. Uh, it, I think this is, this is just what happens. I think this is just. The way this they they want results. Everybody's there to work. Uh, the cost of it isn't really. They say it's the num- the number one driver, but it's really the on- the number one driver for the owners. It's not the employees. It's not their number one driver. And so it's it's not really a cost thing. Even though, depending on who you're talking to, you might say it is. You know what I mean? Like they're lying truly about what the motivations are because they're probably deceiving themselves to a degree. So are are they are they lying or do they not? get it right like i i would almost say they don't get the value of it otherwise they would advocate for it because it would be better for the company which would be better for them but what they do know is results and status updates and development code being produced and they do know the value of that see i i almost think of it differently that that agile has trained people to you know value tickets moving from left to right in mm-hmm. Jira yeah, or some other sure. Kanban yep, board. Yep, yep. And not like actual right, yes. like good architecture. Right. Yes. Now of course I agree. if someone tries to sell you on like a two hundred hour architecture session, that's obviously a, a scam, right? But uh, you know, a day of architecture seems like super reasonable to yep. me. Mm-hmm. Of course it is. It just does. Yeah, of course. Um and you know this the, yeah I mean, I, let, let's just jump into another thing. Like the, the small, medium, large, right? Number three on his list here. Okay, so the, the amount of work has no bearing on the time to completion is, is, is his assertion. And I've also found that to be true um, because the amount of actual dev work is often not related or sometimes inversely related to the amount of political work to get the dev done. Mm-hmm. Do you have an InfoSec team that doesn't want to cooperate with you and give you like debug logs, which is something that happened to me? So then you're like poking in the dark to try to find a bug that a simple, you know, stack trace would uh, would probably point out in an hour or less. So you're you're proposing that larger projects take no longer to complete than smaller projects. Oh, uh, so so I'm talking tasks, right? Individual tasks. Uh, what what uh, I'm uh, what I am uh. saying is what he is proposing actually is that there is not a necessarily a linear correlation between the size okay. of the dev task. And the amount of time it takes to accomplish that task. Okay. And I, what I would say is that I would I, that that has very recently been my experience, um, because uh, politics can get in the way. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And politics um, could be could be uh, a lot of different things too. Politics can be like uh, there's different there's different departments within the business that uh, they feel that their department needs to be better represented, etc. I had a project very much like that where there was a process of working out uh which divisions deserve the most time and work and it was um it was six weeks of me attending meetings while they hashed that out with no work getting done six weeks of meetings yeah Yeah. i mean i i I could tell you horror stories i mean which uh I don't even want to go into it in too much yeah. detail, but yeah. I, I, I very recently had one that was unbelievable. So, <laughs> you know, a lot of this rings true. I mean, mm-hmm. unmanaged complexity is one I, I would actually question a little bit. Because um, what does that really mean? Right. 
you know, I guess he's saying without managing the complexity of it or going back and refactoring code or automating aspects of it, uh, then it's going to take longer and longer to implement new features each year. So even if your team well, remains the same size, having to go from three days to six weeks is not unheard of. Uh, as well, that the, just sounds like technical debt, right? Yes, that's just, yes, that's what I would you, yeah. know, mm-hmm. you run up your Amex and now everything is a lot more expensive Yep, because you're paying all this interest. Yeah. Um, and I think the key here, although this is where I diverge, you know, he has his bullet point to be agile. You spend a good deal of money and energy on, or, you know, doing the work that matters, automation, changing management culture, adjusting on how you fund initiative, allocating resources, mapping value streams, and a look at shared services. I would actually say that that order is not quite right. Mm, okay. I would I would put automation, particularly deployment automation, at the top because I've seen so many agile projects fall apart. Because there's like one dude who can who's like the deployment wizard. Yes, right? and then he's gone and, or something. Right, <laughs> and it's December. And, Wife right. has and a baby. That was what happened to us. Wife had a baby, gone for a couple of weeks. Right. And and now the business stakeholders have invested, you know, whatever they've invested, and they can't get it deployed to production. Meanwhile, the, the PM on the vendor side is like, "Yo, we need to keep pushing this. Let's let's keep doing more work." Yep, and they're yep. like, "Yeah, yeah." <laughs> I mean, we've all been there, right? Yep. Yeah. And of course, but then when you go back and say, listen, if we automate this deployment, if we bring in Docker, or we bring in Jenkins, or whatever it's going to be, people immediately cringe and say, well, we don't really want to automate the deployment. We actually, we really do want like direct database access. Yeah. We yeah. don't want to go through your application level interface. Yeah. Or yeah. actually, oh, gee, so you would be able to deploy without like consent? Uh, so this, we don't is, know consent. This, is, this is where it's particularly hard for a consultant uh, or a contractor right. because... In an IT department, you would just sort of do this stuff in the background. Like you would just sort of, you would just sort of, well, we'll build, we'll build it so it, you know, our process is using automated deployment. They tell us to do it and we use that system. And you don't really have to get explicit permission there necessarily, depending on how you build it. Some circumstances vary. But with you, you have to propose like a solution where everything's detailed and they get to go through this solution, this proposal, and they get to nitpick every little son of a bitch detail from, the deployment methodology to the color of the toolbar. And it is it is tedious. It's a whole other level of tedium that I don't think corporate developers deal with as much. Would you agree? See, I don't have a lot of experience in the inside of the corporate development, but I would say that your, your picture that you painted for consulting is pretty accurate. I mean, in the initial sales conversation, everybody's super down with automating deployments, right? But then you get down to brass tacks at the end of like actually working out the process once the contract's signed. And you get into things like, well, actually, you know, so-and-so needs to sign off on every deployment. <laughs> yeah. So that needs to be a manual process. Um, or actually, we kind of do want to like manually edit whatever it is in the app, right? The database or whatever. It's got their little pet peeve. Um, and then you really throw out a, a lot of the advantages of that stuff, and you end up in a situation where, okay, we're doing you know big builds and big deployments again. Hmm. So uh, rearranging his list out any more than that? I mean, I because uh, I got you off on a side change. I've been doing that today. I apologize. Just fired up about this topic uh, more than I thought I would be. But you were kind of restructuring the list a bit. I know you kind of just re- you redid the top couple. Any other thoughts on this yep. before we? I would actually add something, and I think it goes into his value streams. Thing. Um, working in like monthly iterations and then coming back and saying, okay, what went well, what failed, um, what could we have done better, what was surprisingly easy that we thought was hard, mm. and where do we go from here, uh, is a quick way to, I think, for relatively, even on our internal product, right? This is what we're doing at Alice. We're pivoting her a little bit. We're doing some changes because, you know, we, we, we did a monthly iteration, and there are some things we'd like to change. Instead of doing like a giant quarterly release cycle, that's it, right? You do one month. If, from the consulting perspective, you know, if you if you can't afford a month of your vendor services, that means you probably can't afford consultants. So it's true. It, it's it's a small enough time frame that the, the risk is relatively low, but the the output can be high enough that you can see real value. Yeah. It's wise. That's wise, Mr. Dominic. You should you should offer these services like on a on like a fee basis where you consult with people. You know, like oh my that. God, if only people went to like themadbotter.com. 
<laughs> now we turn to Mr. Dominic's crystal ball, and uh, this is fascinating. My 20 years experience of a software of software development methodologies, and it's incredible. This article is inspired by a book that I'm actually reading right now. I'm on chapter six of the book. Six. Building pyramids. I'm on chapter six of Sapiens: A Brief History of Humankind. Really, really good book. Just started a, a couple of nights ago, and uh, this article has been inspired by it. Are, are you? Have you read Sapiens? Or you, um, no, I, I have not. I it's recommend it. Okay. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm on Audible too. Yep, on, and I, okay. I've liked it a lot so far. There's a couple of gruesome moments in there, so. Uh, the first part I listened to with my with my son and uh, just a first like two chapters I can't remember part of it but then like uh, we stopped and when I continued listening they started talking about some 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 stuff that probably wasn't kid safe so I'm, the time you worked out so it's not all kid safe but at least the first few chapters but it's very very fascinating anyways that's not what we're here to talk about but if you're looking for a book recommendation Sapiens a brief history of humankind. I recommend it. The basic thesis of the book is that humans require collective fictions, quote unquote, so that we can collaborate in large numbers, uh, like larger than 150 or so, our brains, uh, so our brains are big enough to cope with that, like around that by default. That's hard. Let me reread that because that's hard to even understand. And I'm reading the book. Uh, the basic thesis of the book is that humans require collective fictions. Like, like, like groups, like tribes, like either be a business or a tribe or whatever, so that we can collaborate in large, larger numbers than 150 or, or so, so that our brains are big enough to cope with that by default. All right, it's just written weird. Collective fictions are things that don't describe solid objects in the real world, uh, so we, but we can, like things we can see and touch, things like religion or nationalism, liberal democracy, or even the concept of a business. Uh, but we act like they do. Uh, and we so we easily forget that they're not actually things that really truly exist, and uh, that somehow leads into his thought about the process of software development, which is fascinating. W what did you take from this part of it? It's definitely interesting, right? There is a uh, religious aspect to how people treat their methodologies. Ah, uh, so the, like like the waterfall technique. So he started thinking about it in the terms of God was waterfall. Uh, that's that's heavy stuff there. In the beginning, there was the, the document of record, <laughs> and it was good. I'm sorry, what? <laughs> uh, that's, that's really fascinating. Um, so I guess if you really wanted to go all in, you should read the book and then read this post. Then it gets to Agile. I started hearing the word Agile in 2003. Uh, I don't think I'd ever, ever properly read up on it. <laughs> uh, anyways. What do you think the next 20 years of software methodology will look like? That's really the, uh, the thrust behind the post, as they say. What's your you thrust know, I for think the next 20? I, th I think we're about to have a, not a, I wouldn't call it a regression, but I would say a pulling back from Agile a little bit. Um, or, or a correction, maybe. I think Agile's actually gone insane. Yeah, okay. <laughs> it's not Agile. It's not Agile. What did that guy say? Don't blame Agile. Uh, Agile is worthless unless it serves a catalyst for continuous improvement. So there you right. go. There you go. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I do think, though, as automation sweeps through the rest of the economy, it, we're going to see a lot of it in development. Um, and I think the areas that it's going to hit, just just like it is in the rest of the economy, are going to be like the lower, I would say, low, lower value to cost ratio stuff, so like automated QA, right? We're already seeing a lot of automated testing. I think we're going to see a lot more sophisticated, automated, like design QA, like matching the color, sure. text codes and things. Yeah, I like that. Hey, Mr. Dominic, speaking of continuous improvement, uh, any, anything new over there at themadbutter.com? Anything uh, going on? Any uh, stories? Well, we're going to have. Yeah, we're we're going to have some stuff pretty new, and uh, I would say about a week. Ooh, look at you teasing. Well, good. That's good. That's good. You know, I I try to follow you on Twitter, but I, I don't even know what's going on with your Twitter feed anymore. It's a mess. So I, I just have figured I'd just ask you on the show because that thing, I know it. that that Twitter feed of yours, it's I, active. We got to we got to talk about that. Maybe we'll do that in a future. It's, we got to talk. We got to have like some like sort of bot that runs it during the day. We got to have some sort of Twitter therapy, you and I, because uh, it's no good. It's, it's no good. It's no good. Is there anything else you want to mention this week, Mister Dominic? Anywhere you want to send people, etc. Nope. Go to themadbotter.com dot com and follow me at Dominico on Twitter. Magic right there. Concise. Did you ever end up getting that coffee? I mean, it is the end of the show now. I don't, I never heard you, I don't know, it doesn't look good. 
Go follow me. I'm at Chris LAS. Follow the network at Jupiter Signal. Find out when we're live at jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar. And get in the discussion on the Reddit at coderadio.reddit.com. We often check that right before the show, so it's a good way to slip in a little feedback. We always appreciate that. And also, go check out the rest of the great shows on the network, like Linux Action News and User Air, where Mr. Dominic has guested from time to time over at jupiterbroadcasting.com. All right. Thank you so much for joining us, and we'll see you right back here next week. <laughs>